Long before the church had pulpits and play spaces, she had dinner tables and kitchens. Every meal mattered and Jesus pointed the way. Everyone was welcome when Jesus sat at a table. From VIPs to traitors, from religious leaders to shame-filled sinners, from those in the margins to those at the top, he ate with them all. And every meal became a peek into his new ways of living and new ways of loving. After all, why did Jesus come? He came to serve, to give his life, and to seek and save the lost. And how did he come? He came eating and drinking. What we learn at the table with Jesus is what we need for our tables today. Hey there, my name is Jonathan Weibel. I'm the director of Front Yard Mission at Calvary. So glad to be with you today. I want to tell you a story about invitation. We're going to jump into talking about the third rhythm of Front Yard Mission, which is invite often. But I want to tell you about one of the most important invites I ever made. And that was my first date with my glorious bride, Susie. I was a young, young uh, worship leader, and I was an administrative assistant at a church. And if you know me, that's just a little funny um, because I'm not very administrative, nor am I very assistant-y. And uh, so uh, one day I was sitting at the piano and I saw this beautiful woman approach me. It was, it was Susie. And she talked to me for a little bit. I caught her, caught her name, caught her name Susie. And, and um, I was looking at the the signups for the next week in church. And I saw Susie had signed up to work the nursery. And um, it was my job to send out reminders um, to people that they're working the nursery and other different serving opportunities in church. So um, I took my typewriter, yes, my typewriter, and I put in an index card and I typed this. I said, Dear Susie, I think you're really cute and I wanna go on a date with you. Here's my phone number, please call me. And by the way, you're working nursery on Sunday. So I know it was in a complete abuse of the small amount of power that I had as a part-time administrative assistant, Um, but I sent it to her and then I didn't hear back from her. So I got a little concerned. One week went by, two weeks went by, and then I saw Susie sitting on a curb on the street. And I just walked up to her and I said, hey, Susie, did you get my nursery reminder? And she's like, no. And I said, did you get my nursery reminder? Wink, wink. And she's like, no. She's like, if you knew me, you know I'd never sign up for nursery. And then all of a sudden panic came over my my body and I said, realized I had no idea what Susie's last name was. And I just said, what's your last name? And it was Susie Dunton. I had sent this nursery reminder to a Susie Blouser in our church who ended up being a married woman in our church. So that invitation didn't go so well, but it did eventually get me a date with Susie, who later on, in less than a year, became Susie Weibel. And uh, so that was an important invitation. Luke 5, verses 27 through 31 says this. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let me ask a question. When's the last time you've had somebody over for dinner? When's the last time you've invited somebody to your table? 
If you can't remember, it might be time to start to invite neighbors, friends, and people in your sphere of influence to dinner. In the New Testament, we see demonstrated a culture of invitation happening. I want to give you a couple highlights. Jesus invites others to follow him over 20 times. Here he says to Levi, follow me. Andrew invited Peter to meet Jesus. Imagine Christianity without Peter. Andrew invited him. And then in this passage we're looking at today, Levi, or as we're going to refer to him the rest of the time, Matthew, invites his friends to his home for a banquet to meet Jesus. There was this culture of invitation around the table. But here's what I wonder. Have we lost that as a society? And specifically, have we lost that culture of invitation as a church? Here's the thing I want to communicate to you today, or one of the things. It will never happen. It will never happen if we simply depend on our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers to invite us to a meal or anything else for that matter. It's not an understatement that in the seven years that Susie and I have lived in our neighborhood, we have offered over a hundred invitations to neighbors. And without exception, it's only been one couple who kind of regularly invite us over for dinner. They're a Christian couple that live across the street. We did have one, one exception in the seven years, a couple named Brian and Jeff, who simply wanted to say thanks for how we've loved them and invited them many times to our house for dinner and for some front air mission events. And we had a great dinner. But invitation will rarely be reciprocal. If you're waiting around to be invited, it probably ain't going to happen. And it is our job as front yard missionaries to be on the leading edge of invitation. Here's Levi's background. Again, we're going to call him Matthew. But Matthew was one of the 12 original disciples. And he was the only one of the 12 that had any wealth, right? He was a tax collector. And tax collector in Capernaum. And the word tax collector is actually a synonym in the first century for sinner. He was a despised person. Nobody liked it when Matthew showed up because he was collecting taxes. But he was an eyewitness to the three years of Jesus's ministry. And in the end, he wrote one of the gospels and he's considered one of the four evangelists. And at this point, when we pick up the story, Matthew did not know much. He was a, just started following Jesus. All he knew was that this guy, Jesus had changed his life and he wanted his friends to meet him. In front yard mission, we talk about three rhythms. Pray first. It's really important. Praying is not optional. It is the work of front air mission. Love all. And then what we're going to focus on today, invite often. Um, the invite often rhythm has four different types of invitations. To an invitation into your space, invitation into your life, invitation into your faith community, and the invitation into the life of Jesus. So let's look at all four of these invitations kind of through Matthew's eyes. An invitation into your space. Matthew invited them into his house for this banquet. And clearly, Matthew, out of all the disciples, out of the all original 12 disciples, he's the only one who had any kind of wealth and probably had the most spacious house of all the disciples. Now, saying that, any home that we would own or even rent or apartment that we would have in this century would way outdo Matthew's in convenience and in square footage. 
So we can't use this excuse, well, my house or my apartment isn't nice enough. It is. Or it's too messy. All that we have belongs to God. And because God has strategically placed us where we're at in this time, in this history, he strategically placed us so that men and women might reach out to him and perhaps find him. Our house should be a place that we invite people into, and our table should be a place that we invite people around. Henry Nouwen once said this, hospitality is not to change people, but to offer them a space where change can take place. Matthew had just started following Jesus, and all he cared about was that his friends would be in proximity with the Messiah and taste and see that Jesus is good. Our house, our table, our backyard, our front yard should be a space that our neighbors bump into Jesus, place where they rub shoulders with Jesus. In fact, just last night, one of our front yard mission masterclass attendees, and I have all doctors in my class um, that I'm teaching, which I'm not the sharpest crayon in the shed uh, moments when I'm there. You know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room there for sure. Um, But one of them pointed out that the word hospitality has the word hospital in it. And our homes are places for our neighbors to be made well. Jesus even tells the Pharisees here in this passage that It's the sick, not the well, that need a doctor. And so Matthew's inviting them into his space, inviting them into his space. Think of your space and even your table as a possible place for the sick to be made well and to be made whole. That's the first, your space. It belongs to God. Use it. God has called you to use everything that you are Um, to glorify him, and to love your neighbor. Invitation into your life. Matthew opened up his home, opened up his life. He needed Jesus and was not afraid to let his neighbors and friends know he was in need of Jesus. The people he hung out with were mostly the people who were kicked to the curb as well. Lots of tax collectors. The Pharisees were upset that there were sinners um, there. Uh, A meal around the table is such a non-threatening way to develop real relationships and to simply be real with one another. When we live out in the open, we let our neighbors see that even though we follow Jesus, we're not perfect. We're not immune to the pain and the storms of life. We all have the same human experiences. We have the same human experiences that our neighbors do, and they need to know that. We think of the second half of the great commandment, right? Love our neighbors as ourselves. There's generally two interpretations. The the most common one is this, that we should love our neighbors with the same measure that we love ourselves, right? Um, No one's ever hated their own body. No one's, you know, we take care of ourselves first. So we should love our neighbor in the same measure. That's very true. But many of the rabbis of Jesus's day interpreted the Hebrew as love your neighbor who is like you, who is like yourself. We need to love our neighbors because they're like us in our frailties, in our sin, in our messiness. They're like us. When we realize that we are guilty of the same sins that others are, we see that we shouldn't bear grudges against them, but to forgive and love them instead. When we have that kind of perspective, it creates a more welcoming entry point into our lives. Matthew's invited the sinners and the broken and the marginalized people into his house. That's who he is and who he's been. And when we invite neighbors into our life, we don't judge them for their sin. That's not our job. That's God's job. We all sin 
But it seems like the people that we have the most, this is what I've observed anyhow, the people we have the most tolerance for and the neighbors who, who we have the most tolerance for are ones who have sinned like us. Have you noticed that? When they sin differently than us, we tend to judge them harsh, more harshly. Let me prove it to you. Um, just driving here to the office, I noticed there's three types of drivers. Um, there's drivers who drive really slow that you're behind and we call them idiots. And there's drivers that, that wet past me and we call those, you know, those fast drivers who drive too fast. We call them maniacs. And then there's drivers who drive exactly like me, who drive only seven miles over the speed limit. And they're the good drivers, you know? And it, that's just a simple, silly little illustration. But um, just trying to make the point that your neighbors, some of them are going to sin like you. Some of them aren't. But we're all, we're all in the same boat. We just happen to have the forgiveness and salvation of Jesus. So invitation into your space, invitation into your life, be real with people, invitation into your faith community. Those first early disciples that Matthew was a part of was his faith community. These were ragtag followers of Jesus. They were messy, but relatable. When I think about the, the men that followed Jesus, those disciples, Man, they are so, many of them are relatable. Some of them are not, but many of them are relatable to me. I just want to say, um, when you're thinking about your front yard mission, you're, you're the pastor on the street, but think about other people that you can, even just in your, on your street, that you can pull in and um, team up with, because front yard mission is a team sport. I don't do it alone. Uh, and at some point, I need to start thinking about actually inviting my neighbors into my faith community so they can start rubbing shoulders with the people that I love, my friends, my friends at church. Um, often inviting them to a Sunday morning is a really good way to introduce them to your faith community, but it's not the only way. It may not even be the best way. We have some great ways here at Calvary, for example, um, invite them to our food pack that we have in the fall. We pack food for 240,000 refugees. That's a win. Um, we've heard tons of stories of neighbors coming to help serve. They need to see the church in action. And here's a very practical way that we can simply invite our neighbors so they see the church moving out in love. Um, here at Harvest Fields, we have this amazing property, like a couple hundred acres or so for you to invite your friends to. There's hiking. There's amazing bike trails. We put, we put a lot of money into these things. There's Frisbee golf. Or maybe simply invite them to a small group that you're a part of. Uh, maybe we have a, I know Scott Letty, guy that I work with in front of our mission, he's got a board game. Um, Saturday that he does. Invite them to that. Let them rub shoulders with other people who are in your faith community. The truth is, I am not going to be able to reach everybody in my neighborhood. I have a connection and an affinity with some of my neighbors, but not with everybody. But I guarantee you, there's somebody at Calvary, somebody in your faith community, if you don't go to Calvary, that can connect with them even better than you're able to connect with them. They will have affinities with your neighbors that you don't have. Um, last weekend, we did an Easter service in our neighborhood. And uh, I've had a neighbor that I pray for. He's on my hashtag. I pray for him every day. And he's not a believer. He's told me he's not a believer. I've had spiritual conversations with him. I've shared my testimony, I've shared a gospel with him in his backyard. Um, hasn't been super interested yet. Um, but on Sunday, um, we had an Easter service and he heard the music. I was playing guitar and he was walking and he decided to stop in and he got to hear the Easter story. And then afterwards, three younger guys, he's in his 20s, uh, my neighbor, three younger guys were there 
and they talked to him for 30 minutes and they were just having a good old fashioned Jesus conversation with my neighbor. I've had conversations with him, but I'm not 20 something anymore. And I'm positive he was relating a lot more to these younger guys than to a slightly balding but ruggedly handsome 58 year old neighbor. Invitation into our space, into our life, into our faith community. The last one is an invitation into the life of Christ. While retelling my story and actually writing it down, it suddenly dawned on me two years ago that the reason I love neighboring so well and Front Yard Mission so much is I came to Christ through the invitation of a neighbor directly. Um, they, I, I moved out to um, Philadelphia between my sophomore and, sorry, freshman and sophomore year of college. And um, so I moved there and my neighbor started to invite me over for dinner. So I would go over to my neighbors, go to dinner with them. Um, and so this was happening regularly, almost every night. And then they'd like pray for me, and I'm like, well, that's a little weird. Um, but I found out something in these invitations that I actually really liked them and kind of loved them. And, you know, I was just this kind of punk kid, and they kind of loved me. And I'm like, this is pretty awesome. I felt really loved. And um, I happened to bring this book out with me. Um, called Power for Living. Uh, a friend of mine in college, we were getting high one night and we saw this commercial for the book. And he thought it would be hilarious if he sent it to me as a joke. So he sent me this Christian book as a joke because we were making fun of the commercial. And um, I brought this book out with me and I started reading it. And I realized that I was going to hell and I needed Jesus, and it had the four spiritual laws in it, and it made sense to me, for the, the gospel made sense to me for the first time. So I ran over to my next door neighbors, these people who had invited me into their life, they invited me into their space, they invited me into their faith community. And I ran over there, and I knocked on the door, and it was the easiest conversion of all time. I was this 19-year-old kid, June 10th, 1984, sobbing at their door. And all I could get out was, I need Jesus. And this old lady, I call her Aunt Carrie. She wasn't my aunt, but I, I looked at her as an aunt. And she took me by the hand. She led me to the couch and we knelt there. And, and I prayed to receive Christ in my life. And um, things did dramatically change in my life. Um, but it started with an invitation. It started with an invitation. And in closing, so where do you go from here? What do you take from this? Because I don't want you ever to, like, you spent 20 minutes listening. Again, a ruggedly good-looking man. Um, but I want you to take something away. So here's the challenge I want to give you. Um, if you haven't yet, I beg you, create a prayer hashtag. Take a piece of paper, make a hashtag on that piece of paper. Put your name in the middle and on the eight corresponding squares, begin to fill in your neighbor's names and begin to pray for them. I would say pray for them daily. And if you can't do that, at least pray for your neighbors once a week. So start with that. If you haven't done that yet, many of you have, but you haven't. If you haven't, start with that. You can, we're, we are also doing a right now a 24-7 prayer initiative, and you can go to the link at the bottom of your screen to sign up for an hour of prayer. So please do that. But here's part two, maybe more pertinent to this message, is this month, I want to challenge you to invite a neighbor over for dinner. Maybe, maybe you don't have a neighborhood, and that's totally okay. Um, 
maybe invite a coworker or somebody that you you hang out with um, that's not a believer. Invite them over for dinner. I want to give you a couple like while they're at your table. I want to give you a couple of like tips. I guess I would call them. One of the things that Susie and I do, you don't have to do this, but one of the things that we do is we always ask our guests, can I pray for you? Um, it seems a little easier around the table and often people pray before their meals. So they always oblige and they give us something to pray for. So we pray for our neighbors that way. The second thing we do, and this is a little weirder, is that we ask them to crawl underneath our table and we give them a Sharpie and um, we have them autograph the bottom of our table. Here's, uh, here's a picture of our table. That's what our table looks like. And now here's the picture of the bottom of our table. And it will make them feel so valued and it acts as this great guest book for us. Every year we turn our table over and we looked at all, this, all the autographs on the bottom of our table and it reminds us that each one of those signatures has value and our neighbors have value. So I want to challenge you to, to invite somebody over for dinner. Maybe, maybe do that as far as the autographs, maybe not. Maybe pray for them, maybe not. But I want to invite you, I want to invite you to invite a neighbor over. I just want to remind you as I close that in the Old Testament, there's 613 laws. Jesus synthesized them down to only two. The most important thing, love God and love your neighbor. I don't want to heap guilt or shame on anybody. That's not my that's not my thing. But when you wake up in the morning and you look yourself in the mirror, can you really say, I have loved my neighbor? If you can't, you have a new start today. So pray for them regularly and invite someone over this month. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you loved us so much that you died for us and you rose again to defeat the power of sin and death so that you could have relationship with us. You invite us to come and follow you. Lord, you have made us your priests, your pastors in our neighborhood. Lord, let us take that seriously. Let us take the great commandment as not the great suggestion, but really live it out. Teach us what it means to love you and to love our neighbor. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that um, everybody watching and listening would invite a neighbor over and really get serious about praying for their neighbors. We trust you, we thank you, and we pray in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Great being with you today.